Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Alon Tindel. I'm the Director of Data and Threat Research at uh, WIZ, and here with me is Jose. Hi, I'm Jose Vetia. I am a Security Operations Manager for Red Ventures. Uh, I lead a team of seven in multiple clouds, and uh, here to talk to you today about some uh, stories from the cutting edge. So um, today, our plan for today is to cover uh, some of the top cloud threats, but also some other interesting topics that are relevant for uh, threat and uh, cloud security teams um, uh, today, like for uh, modern uh, security teams. And the way that we are going to present, we'll present a topic. I'll, I'll start with a short overview of, uh, um, of, of uh, the top uh, risks over there and what we see as we as a cloud security company, what we see across the different customer environments. And then I'll use the uh, amazing insight that uh, Jose has as someone who, who like, actually is in, in the front line and has to deal with all these type of uh, threats. And we are going to do, I want to uh, prepare you, so we are also going to talk about some other topics like how to build a, a cloud security team. I feel like it's, it's connected. We don't want to talk only about you know, the threats and, and, and product. We also want to cover what is the right way, how to set the right processes, and uh, share some of the uh, great experience that uh, Jose has. OK, so uh, let's start. Um, so just uh, to give you a kind of an intro about Wiz, um, so what we are trying to do uh, is, is to help our customers detect uh, risks and uh, threats in the environment. Now, uh, the research that they were doing as a uh, part of uh, uh, WIZ is, is kind of uh, interdisciplinary research. We do both vulnerability research and uh, research of uh, attackers, of what like, the attackers uh, are doing, which vulnerabilities are they exploiting, and uh, so on. And uh, today, like the result of this uh, research, uh, are uh, uh, turned into over uh, 1,000 uh, of like uh, detections and controls that we have inside our product. Um, and uh, another very interesting aspect is the emerging threats uh, uh, detection that we have, and we are trying to um, to detect these threats within less than 24 hours. And for example. You know, log for shell it was uh, something I'm sure that uh, all of you <laughs> heard about it and uh, most of you experience it. Um, is, so for us, log for shell we uh, had a detection for it uh, within eight hours from the time that the vulnerability was published. And it means that we have to first you know, make sure that we actually detect the, the vulnerability. We actually know how we can find it across customer environments and also understand the impact of this vulnerability and how we can help customers um, know which resources they should uh, patch first. Uh, another example was the OpenSSL vulnerability. So it was actually published with, I mean, th there was an announcement that an OpenSSL vulnerability is coming. Everyone uh, uh, were, uh, yeah, were stressed because <laughs> of uh, Heartbleed. You know, they, everyone thought, okay, it's going to be the next Heartbleed. Uh, we, we were prepared. We added the detection within a few hours, even without the CVE, because the CVE wasn't uh, assigned yet. But uh, eventually the vulnerability wasn't that bad. We also, I mean, as soon as the details were published, we analyzed it and realized that we can recommend our customers and uh, let them know that this is, uh, um, this is not a very critical vulnerability. And I think that it is part of what we're trying to do to provide the context. And context can be um, not, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean, okay, patch it now, everything is critical. Sometimes it's even saying, okay, this issue is, is not you know, that's severe, you can uh, go back uh, to work. I mean, you should patch it, it's important, but it's not uh, uh, the most prioritized thing to do right now. And just uh, to give you a um, kind of a short uh, overview of the research process that uh, we, we do with, with this type of threats is uh, tracking threat intelligence. It can be through open source uh, sources, through our own like research across all the uh, amazing uh, customers that, uh, that uh, we have, uh, doing the analysis by the research team, you know, adding the coverage to, to the product. And then uh, I think the most important part is the actionable part. So it can be uh, you know, some, some, some advisory that we publish inside our product, but also an external um, a blog, and we are trying to give the context, such as like in the OpenSSL case, trying to help you know the uh, general public understand whether this issue is indeed critical and how prevalent is this issue. And we're really trying to leverage the visibility that we have uh, across you know different uh, customers and understand whether a new vulnerability is something that is going to be the next log for shell. I mean, is it something that if it is now exploited in the wild by attackers, is going to be? Um, really um, uh, impactful and, uh, and uh, or maybe even like uh, you know, a new, new disaster, or if it's uh, um, 
a vulnerability that, that uh, you know, you, you should patch, but uh, you should uh, prioritize other uh, issues as well before. And with prioritization, it's always important to remember that you have also the internal prioritization within your organization. And it's, uh, so if you have a vulnerability on a resource with high permissions that is exposed to the internet, it's not the same situation like a vulnerability on a, a resource in a test environment, internal uh, VM, without any special uh, keys, secrets, or, uh, or permissions. So we are trying to help customers understand that. And especially, uh, I think it's, it's most important when you have large environments and you have you know, a small team and, uh, um, and you need to be really effective and really understand how to prioritize, what should you do first? Sometimes it can be the difference between being, uh, and being breached or, uh, or not. Okay. So that was the kind of a short intro to uh, sa some of the things that uh, uh, we are doing uh, in, in the team. And we want to start today with uh, a new thread, the uh, API security. And I think that we've seen in the past year across, uh, if, if you read um, in the news and sa some of the things that uh, we've seen uh, across different environments is the threat of uh, um, like APIs, attackers trying to leverage um, exposed APIs and we'll explain why is it such a, a critical issue, and I want to start with uh, an example. So uh, this is something that happened a few months ago, the uh, Optus uh, breach, and in, in their case, they had this uh, API uh, endpoint that was exposed, and if you, like, all, all you had to do, the attackers had to do, is to um, uh, kind of manipulate this uh, URL, and, they, and they, then they could have access, uh, to have unauthenticated access to uh, customer data. And the result was that uh, over 11 million uh, customer records were uh, um, acquired by the uh, attackers and it was a, a result in a $1 million extortion uh, uh, threat to this company. And what you see here, it's really the attack was as simple as that. You see this URL, you only you need to do is, you know, to kind of to manipulate it and then you can get uh, customer data. Okay, now why is it such a, a hard issue and specifically harder in the cloud? So first of all, you have API, um, uh, you, you, I mean, it's, it, using APIs is really, really common. And also, I mean, the, the, I think the number one problem, and we're going to talk about it further soon, is the visibility, even understanding where do you have these API endpoints. And I want to just, I'm, I'm curious maybe to see here in the crowd, so who knows how many API uh, endpoints uh, they have in the organization? Okay, good, I'm happy. <laughs> okay, um, uh, so, so uh, first of all, really understanding all the APIs, but also on top of that, when you have an API endpoint, trying to understand what's behind it. And there are so many different layers. So you have the network layer, you have the identity layer, and you have sometimes even the actual uh, um, database that is uh, behind it or the storage uh, uh, bucket. There, there could be you know, uh, many different, uh, uh, or maybe serverless, there, there could be uh, so many different uh, services behind it and you need visibility into all these different uh, layers. So that's, that's you know, the challenge, even understanding, even if you know all your API endpoints, in, in you map them, trying to understand what's, what's behind them and if there was a configuration change, what data is it going to expose? Um, and yeah. Uh, great. Okay, so we have kind of a checklist for how to, uh, um, how, how to try and mitigate this API uh, security risk, but I think I want to start with a question to Jose. So how, how do you uh, start even handling uh, the API security issue in your organization? 100%, so like with APIs, the first thing is getting an inventory, understanding what you have out there especially if you have a small team, right, like myself, one thing you want to prioritize is, okay, those APIs are exposed, but then take it a step further. How many of those APIs are, have authenticated access? And start working on that with each team, build that trust, understand what they're doing, and then working your way through the environment with a good inventory. Once you have those APIs that are unauthenticated, understanding what they're connected to, if those databases have any kind of information that you don't want to be <laughs> publicly express, uh, accessible, and then also taking them down if they're not needed to be exposed to the world. So it's really understanding what you have, validating what you have, and then working with each team to understand you know, how you can make them better, right? And creating that partnership. I think that's really important. 
So, so how, I mean, maybe I think one of the recurrent themes that we are going to have today is uh, how do you build this partnership between the security teams and the engineering teams? And this is something that is as critical in, in uh, cloud environments because most of the teams who actually fix the issues are the engineering teams, not the security teams. So how, how do you do it? What, how, how do you recommend organizations doing it? So in our case, uh, we took an approach of using a security champs program. You've heard this before in different talks. We took this on and basically distributed one key resource on every business unit in our organization. And that resource is dedicated to the security of that a business unit and they are our main contact point whenever we have questions or whenever we want to empower or release new tools we involve them in the process and get them early on in anything that we're looking at from a you know detection or response or even from an infrastructure perspective and i think that has helped us greatly in understanding feedback from every business unit we have in our org to you know get perspective from their end right like hey these are some blockers we're running into, or hey, these are some things we would like to see, uh, and really helped us foster that two-way communication between our overall organization and, and getting better every day. So, and how do you become such a champion? So you took engineers, and you know some of them they probably don't have any security background. So how do you turn them into someone who can be really effective in in their job? That is a great question. So it starts with just general interest. You know, there's always a couple of folks in any organization that are curious or that ask some very interesting questions regarding security. We typically uh, go for those folks and engage them first. And then if we don't get that kind of engagement, then we go to the uh, different leadership teams on each business unit and we ask them straight up, hey, do you have anyone that would be interested in doing this? And they're like, actually, yes, we have this one person who's always finding these issues or they are always finding these issues. And I feel those are the best people to champion and uh, carry that message forward. The, f the folks that are actually interested, motivated, and curious. So it's been a good, it's been a good experience. And how long have been you doing this uh, program? About a year now. Yeah. And can you tell like the difference from the time before you started using uh, like th these champions? H how things look uh, now? Really good. Um, it's really fostered this two-way communication path. Uh, we meet with them monthly, and we talk through different issues and things that you know need to be addressed or things that need to be uh, escalated or just general feedback about tooling that we have. And it's been really great in fostering this really good relationship between security and the developers and also the business units because then those champions go to their to their team meetings and they talk about the stuff and then we hear about it from their leadership team and going i heard you're doing this and you're like yeah how did you hear about that oh so and so told me i'm like that's awesome so it's really fostering this culture of you know sharing getting excited about security which most people aren't but you know we're getting there little by little and it's 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 uh it's really good Wait, now let's get back to your team, uh, to what you do with your team. So you raised your hand when you said that, uh, when I asked if uh, you know how many API endpoints you have in the organization. So how, how do you do it? How, how, how do you uh, find all of them? Well, we have a great tool uh, that we use for our API endpoints uh, to find them across all of our clouds. And then we start prioritizing and understanding what each one does and making sure they have the proper tags and uh, classifications needed to make sure that if we ever have an issue or anything like that, we know exactly what we're dealing with. So it's been really beneficial to understand what our inventory is and what we have as a whole perimeter. It's been really, really good. And like beyond the perimeter, how do you understand what, what's actually behind how do you validate what what's uh, the data is not exposed or what's actually uh, connected to this api endpoint so we leverage our champs uh, along with some of my staff and we at scale you know have ways to look at you know what how they're responding how the apis are responding and then from a connectivity perspective we leverage a uh, different tooling to let us know how things are connected and then we roll it back and it gives us that visibility and because we classify them as we go, anything that's not classified, we throw them into the bucket and we start all over again. And we ask really good questions. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. That was really insightful. Is there anything else you want before we move on to the next topic? <laughs> no, okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think just to summarize, so I think the, the most uh, important steps are really like having, understanding the inventory, understanding what API endpoints do we have, but, and, and then understanding what's, what's behind them, really connecting the different dots and, and uh, 
understanding what's there. But it's always important to remember that security is, all, is also about the people and setting the right processes uh, and, and finding the way to collaborate with the engineering teams. Because most of the time, they are the ones who actually know why the system is built this way, why things are configured this way. So it's, it's always about, I think, this is why we wanted to start with, with this topic. I mean, you need to understand that security, and especially in the cloud, is, is a collaboration between engineering teams and the security team. So finding this, uh, um, um, the way to collaborate together is, is the first step to, to secure your organization. OK, now the next thread that we'll cover is data exposure. Um, so we had an inter interesting experience, experiment a few, uh, a few weeks ago. And we tried to see uh, you know, how fast uh, an exposed bucket will, uh, will be accessed by, by you know, someone on the internet. And uh, we found when we had a uh, three bucket with uh, a common name, it was accessed by uh, attackers uh, within seven hours. And that's, that's I mean, you know, it, it means that if you do you know, very simple mistake, you will pay for that. Uh, and when we try to uh, do some, something similar, we put the uh, bucket uh, um, name on, on GitHub, it was accessed uh, within 13 hours. So, I mean, you see that if you, um, I mean, if you do, you know, with, with buckets, with S3 buckets, it's really easy to, to uh, expose them. Now I have to say that AWS uh, added a lot of uh, different, you know, kind of uh, warnings when you do it and you, you have to work harder in order to do it. Uh, but uh, it's still, I mean, it's still an issue and still something that if you work with, you know, uh, maybe um, uh, set, set, set your environment with Terraform or with other, uh, uh, tools, it, it, I mean, it, you, you can still uh, do these mistakes and accidentally expose your data. And when your data is accidentally exposed, it will, it's very likely that it will uh, be um, uh, accessed by, by attackers. And overall, we see, I think, that uh, not only if we speak not only on S3 buckets, but on, uh, um, on data bases in general, we see across, uh, um, the, across cloud environments that 55% of them have at least one publicly exposed uh, database or um, a data storage uh, uh, bucket exposed to the internet. And we keep seeing all these different uh, um, uh, exposures of, of companies and in this I mean I think that that maybe the problem is that it's not only about you know the security of your customers there are some you know legal consequences to to data uh, exposure and when we want to talk about you know what's what's uh, um, um, like why is it such an important problem I think there are some similarities to what we discussed before with with APIs because you have all the, these different layers and you have the network uh, layer you have the identity layer and you have the question of like what what data is actually uh, uh, there what's what's uh, stored in this uh, database and we have to remember so in the cloud there are so many ways to store data you have the past services and it can be services like uh, RDS, for example. You have, uh, the, uh, you have storage, but you can also have hosted databases. You can just spin up your uh, you know, VM with the Postgres uh, uh, database on it or with you know, any, any other database uh, on it. And as, as a security team, you have to know that your engineers, they might use you know, each one of these uh, services, and you might also have you know, just SaaS services, external third parties that, that store your data. So even understanding like, where do you have the data and what type of data is there is a very you know, it's a difficult question in the cloud. It can like, change on, on daily basis. So that's, that's a um, complex challenge. And then even if you know where your data is stored, you have to understand all the different layers, understand the configuration. If you have, you know, maybe a load balancer uh, that, that, is, uh, that might be misconfigured, then, you know, uh, eventually expose your data. If you have APIs, uh, API endpoints that, that can access this data, so many ways to, to access it and so many, like, different network and identity configurations that you have to analyze. So, um, yeah, so the, the visibility and visibility even to self-hosted databases is, is important. And uh, understanding the configuration of the past database is something that is also really important and also like a very difficult task to so many databases. And I want to give you so um, uh, like another interesting example. Today we are uh, seeing you know the uh, use of AI, new AI services like uh, uh, for example AWS Bedrock. It's a new uh, AI service that uh, um, uh, is, it was uh, um, introduced a few uh, weeks ago. And you can think about these uh, services also like as some like small databases because when you train the models 
and uh, you, you sometimes you know, store uh, customer data on them. And so the engineers and the AI engineers, they'll just go and want to you know, start developing new services on top of that. And all these AI services are cloud-based, so it will be in the cloud environment. But security teams have to learn and understand you know, all the different configurations and even know that, that someone has started to use it inside the organization. So you know, data can be everywhere, and you know, the, the data, it, it can change. It can, it's always, always changing. Okay, so uh, Jose, for you, now, let's, let's uh, get back to you. So how do you even start you know, understanding where the data is inside the organization? Yeah, it starts with a good inventory, back to that again. However, in this case, when it comes to data, it's what you were saying, right? It's not just about the services being leveraged, it's also about what we're self-hosting, what's been forgotten about, what no longer has ownership, and, and, and making sure you have a process to identify and get those things owned and managed and, you know, mitigated if it needs to be mitigated or just, you know, uh, handled, right, from a security perspective. So first things first, ga gaining that visibility, classifying what you have, making mm -hmm. sure you know where your crown jewels are in your environment. It ties back to the API conversation, right? It's having a good inventory and classifying this data is, is critical. And then just understanding and monitoring for when those changes arise. Because you know, things are gonna change and you gotta change with the business and you gotta understand where you have an exposure or if you have a misconfiguration that can make something uh, happen that you don't want to happen, you wanna understand what that is. So it goes back to making sure 100% you have that visibility and that inventory. And how do you do the data uh, classification? Because you might have, I mean, you have large organization, you know, different teams using the data. I mean, how, how do you even understand like where the data, like wh wh what's the data? Is it sensitive? Is it not sensitive? How, how can you tell? That's a great question. And we get this a lot, even in my org. We actually uh, document and communicate what each data type is and how we want them to classify it. And we constantly reiterate, here are the, here are the data classifications that we use internally, and this is how we want you to classify the data. And if we find something that's not classified correctly, we correct it and we, and we train those folks on like, hey, you've tagged it this way, but it's actually something supposed to be different. And we go about um, training and making sure we're empowering each team so that they can understand what our classification is for our organization. So it's just about communication. Going back to the initial thing, it's really about empowering the folks that are working in our org and then making sure they understand the rules, right? The rules to the game. We like to gamify everything. So we always say, we, we're going to give you the rules to the game, and then we're all going to play together. So, and it works out pretty well. Um, and we saw, like in the first slide, that you know, data exposed data can be almost accessed almost immediately by by attackers. And wh what is the um, way for you to handle such in like data incidents? Because it's not like I mean, like a, you know, like a classic SOC incident when you know you have might have a malware or, a bi or like a Bitcoin miner inside your environment. This is kind of a different type of incident. So what is the process? Okay, data is exposed. What happens next? So that's a great question. So you know, every business unit is different, um, and every org is different. It's understanding what their risk appetite is and, and what uh, they're willing to, you know, what they're willing to accept. For us, it's mostly about automation and making sure that if that were to happen, we have a quick way to shut that down. So building guardrails is a, is a great way to do that. And then also making sure you're communicating those guardrails so people understand if there was to be something that, we're gonna, that was going to expose data, they understand that... Uh, we would have a mitigation in place that's gonna protect them. And if that causes an outage, so be it, they understand the risk, right? But it's all about communication up front before that even happens. So making sure all your stakeholders are aware of whatever automations you're putting in place to do this type of mitigation. Okay, so uh, b before we uh, conclude, so if you have like one, one question that uh, you know, the, everyone in the crowd should ask themselves about the data and the organization, what, what, what would it be? Do you know where your crown jewels are? Today, can you say with confidence, you know where all of your crown jewels are for the most important data in your organization? I think that's a great question. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean, with all like many other uh, cloud issues, it's always about you know pr trying to even avoid the incident. So we talked about how you mitigate incident, but the best thing to do is even to uh, avoid it and you know make sure that you know where your data is and you know whether it is protected or not. So uh, thank you. Let's.
move to the next topic. So supply chain risks and think uh, supply chain. So it became a very, very uh, you know popular uh, threat. And I think so it, with with the solar winds attack. I think this is when the first time when it. Uh, Everyone really saw the the massive impact that such uh, issue can can uh, result, and when we talk about uh, supply chain risks in the cloud, we actually have there is a very interesting um, angle, and you have like in in the cloud uh, there is the shared responsibility model, and uh, I try to explain it really shortly. It's it's uh, way complex than that, but you have the infrastructure that is built by the cloud providers, and they are the ones that. I mean, are responsible for that. And there is the code that is running and that uh, the uh, cloud customers are using and deploying. But there is also a gray uh, uh, zone in the middle. And this is a software that is actually uh, deployed by, by the cloud provider, but it's running on the uh, VMs and, uh, and, and uh, resources that are owned by the customers. And one example is the Oh My God vulnerability. It's a vulnerability that uh, was found by the Wiz uh, research team and by Nir, who is actually sitting here in the crowd. Um, and it was uh, in a, a library that is used by uh, uh, Azure. And, and they, they install it on, as part of uh, the use of their services, they install it on uh, the customer VMs. And we saw that this library was installed by, uh, used by 60% of Azure uh, customers. And it had a vulnerability. And uh, we, we found this vulnerability, we reported it, of course, uh, uh, we responsibly uh, disclosed it. The vulnerability was patched. But the problem was that no one really knew that, that if, if they used this uh, library or not. It was kind of a very you know, secret library. No one really uh, knew if, if they use it. And this is how this problem, uh, I mean, this is exactly the problem. So you have now a, a, a vulnerability. It's really easy to exploit it. Attackers started exploiting it in, in the wild um, after, after, after the patch because it was so easy to, to exploit it. Uh, but most of the cloud customers didn't know that, that it's there. And this is exactly the supply chain. So code that is written by someone else is vulnerable or is tempered. And, and then, uh, you know, attackers can leverage it. And you don't even know that it's in your environment. So that's, that's a, um, kind of, you know, like a, in one interesting angle about, uh, about the supply chain and risk. And we have another interesting angle that uh, we'll uh, present soon, but just kind of uh, showing uh, why, why is it not only about, uh, you know, uh, packages. So you have, you know, any third party code, any third party resource that, that you are using might be, uh, um, uh, you know, might be infected. And we saw uh, recently some cases where attackers deliberately try to hack specific companies and change the code of their services, like uh, in the SolarWind case, and, and uh, so they can, you know, then add their implants over there, or like, you know, add like uh, change the code to create vulnerabilities, and uh, and and after they do that, they the code is you know deployed to the customers and to the customer environment, and they start exploiting it, or maybe use the malicious code to search for secrets for uh, uh, AWS uh, 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 secrets and, and then, you know, use the secrets for initial access or to access data in the uh, customer environment. Now, uh, okay, so we, we, we don't want to scare you. I mean, of course, this is something that is really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a problem, but there are also, you know, some solutions. So it's, it's not, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, it's not only uh, a, bad, a bad thing. And I, I want to cover, so we talked mostly about the software, uh, what we call software-based supply chain risk. But in the cloud, there is another uh, supply chain risk, and this is uh, what we call identity supply chain risk. And I'll uh, explain uh, shortly, and we'll have another slide for that uh, in, in a minute. So in, in the cloud, you and you know, other, like everyone who uses the cloud, also allow third-party services to access their cloud environment. And you let them have you know, permissions to uh, you know, sometimes even like sensitive permission to access your data, maybe you know, create VMs, maybe you know, um, even hire or admin permissions to some, uh, uh, some resources, and, and you give it to a third party. But what happens if this third party is hacked? So uh, we will uh, explain it uh, shortly. So that's the uh, OMI case, uh, I, I covered it. But for the identity one, so you give the third party, uh, this third party access, and we see how common it is. So 82% of companies provide third party vendors highly privileged roles. And, and you, have to, uh, you have to understand that if you do it, I mean, this is something that it's OK to do. I mean, it's part of cloud environment. But you should ask yourself whether they really need all the permissions. That's the first question. 
And even after the first time when you, when you added this, this role to your environment, you should ask yourself whether these uh, permissions are really being used. And you know, maybe they have just you know, excessive permissions that are not really being used, but no one monitors it. So, so I mean, it's just there. And then in case uh, the, this third party is breached, you, uh, they will be able to access your environment. And we, we see that attackers, and we saw some uh, use case of APT, like uh, here, the uh, Nobelium uh, group. This is an APT group that is uh, uh, associated with uh, uh, um, uh, Russian uh, nation state uh, actors. So they are like, trying to find these companies that have access to uh, uh, like M MSPs, MSSPs that have access to uh, uh, many environments in order to get access to their customers. Okay, so Jose, how, how is it, um, so let's start with the identity supply chain. How the process of adding a new role, a third party role to an environment looks like? So first and foremost, before we even get there, we, we wanna build a relationship with the vendor, right? With, with whoever we're dealing with. We're obviously reaching out to these vendors because they have a service we want. So first thing at first is understanding you know, what, their, what the escalation path is for any vendor, what is their email, what are their SLAs, and then from there, when they ask for access to anything, we question and push back. How many of you folks actually push back when vendors ask you for excessive access? I think everyone should be doing this. I think it's a great way to uh, help the security community as a whole, because a lot of times, these vendors just need input. They think they need more access than what they do, and pushing back is a, is a great first step, but also understanding the escalation path so that if there was an issue, especially from an identity perspective, you have a good escalation path to ask those good pointed questions. Like, hey, are we affected? Hey, do we have a problem? Do you have a problem? You know, these are, these are all things you wanna build. It's a two-way street with any vendor. So you wanna make sure you foster that relationship with them as well. And then you also wanna make sure that you are definitely asking, do they need those permissions? And in some cases, just take it away and see what happens. If nothing breaks, just go for it and then give them that feedback. Like, hey, I've been running this for three weeks and nothing's happened. I think that's a much better approach in giving some of these vendors so much access. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. So I have like an, another source for my own is the security research team in Wiz. We sometimes help our uh, product security team. And yeah, there was a third party service that uh, we wanted to use and we talked with, with this vendor. We reviewed the different permissions and we really saw like there, there were some permissions that we, we didn't understand why, why they are there. I mean, it didn't make any sense. Uh, we pushed back and we told them that we don't uh, want to, uh, like we are not going to approve uh, this role and they actually removed them. So it's, it's also a good thing to do for the community because this is the kind of a way to you know, help everyone and uh, make sure that uh, to reduce uh, the risk uh, for everyone. Um, now let's get, to the, let's get back to the software supply chain. So I think another interesting um, um, impact, so other than uh, just libraries is like using images. So we use like in many cases, um, um, you know, container images that are coming from, you know, external sources. And how, how do you even check? How do you validate that they're okay? Yeah, so with the container pipe, we, we obviously created a container pipeline where we validate every package and try to stay up to date on all the vulnerabilities in those different packages and just you know assess the same as with roles, really. Do you need all of these packages that are in these containers and are they effective for what you're trying to do? And just constantly reevaluating that and making sure you're exhausting all your options when looking at how you're trying to achieve that goal with that container or, or with those images, right? Uh, but it starts with patching, making sure you're staying up to date on all of the vulnerability patching that's available for whatever you're trying to use. And also just continuously asking yourself, do I need this? I think that's a great, great step. Now let's get back to the recurring theme uh, for today. So who actually owns this process? So is it you, is it the developers? Who is, I mean, an image is used by you know, developers and are, you, know, the, you can have you know, different layers inside the image. So who is actually like the owner of, of, of the image? That's a great question. So we, we essentially have a team that owns the process of the pipeline and then our developers are able to basically engage via pull request and engage in fixing or augmenting and then we put roll that into the, those images. And then what we do from a security perspective is we make sure we're scanning and keeping track of those vulnerabilities and then just pushing, hey, are you staying up to date on the vulnerabilities? Hey, are you addressing these vulnerabilities? And trying to get to a place where we're constantly mitigating the biggest risk in our work from a vulnerability and supply chain perspective. 
And what, what is your biggest challenge with, with this process? I mean, what's the, the so, like, biggest challenge with the supply chain? Some, some packages aren't fixable. So then it goes back to, okay, well, what do we do now? It doesn't have a patch. What, so then we start looking at compensating controls and making sure we're looking at, hey, does this need to be external? Hey, does this even need to be running? And going from there. But it definitely starts with having those conversations and making sure you have folks on your development teams that you can talk to about this stuff to understand the need, mm -hmm. right? Because that's, that's major. Okay, thank you. So I just want to go and show the quick checklist for the supply chain risk. So I think there's an interesting issue that we touched before with, oh, oh my God, and like software that is being uh, uh, like introduced by cloud providers. And in many cases, these, these vulnerabilities, so with packages, they have CVE and, and then you can know it. But with uh, some of the cloud services and uh, cloud vulnerabilities, these cases, they don't have a CVE. So there is a project, a community project that we started. It's the uh, Open Cloud Vulnerability and Security Issue uh, Database. Uh, it's an uh, open uh, project. You can, it's uh, like the URL Cloud VulnDB. You can see it uh, um, on, on the screen. And this is a place where we kind of uh, uh, collect all these different issues. And the purpose is, is you know, to, to help different teams and help you make sure that these issues are not in your environment and that you know how to fix them because there's no place, there's no database like the CVE, like the NVD database for, for uh, vulnerabilities. And you have to make sure that you're also, uh, that, I mean, that, that your environment is, is, is clean from these issues. So I, I'd recommend, uh, recommend going there. It's a, a project started as a community project and we kind of uh, helped uh, uh, setting it up and setting this website and we keep uh, uh, updating, updating this uh, this uh, website. We have here also Mirav, who is one of the collaborators uh, who makes sure that uh, the vulnerabilities are uh, being added to this uh, project. Um, and uh, with that, is there anything else about uh, supply chain risks that you'd like to add before we move on? Just as a community, let's just make sure that whenever you have vendors that you know are asking for excessive access, just continue to push back. I think as a community, that's something that we could do as a team together to make sure that as the broader security community, we have proper roles for the stuff needed. And that's gonna be huge. Thank you. Okay, uh, so next topic. Now we are moving to like the topics that are more about how, how to deal with these issues, not only you know, covering the threats, but what, what do you do about them? So um, in, in cloud environments, there are, you know, like doing the detection and response uh, processes is, is a whole different story from doing it on endpoints, on, you know, on-prem environments, because first you don't um, uh, necessarily know like who owns the, the resource or like why is this is there, what is the, what, what, what is it doing? Uh, the environment changes really, really fast. I mean, you can have, you know, a day with 100 new VMs in your environment and maybe the day later they're all gone. So you, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you have to keep track on what's, what's uh, happening there and also uh, response uh, processes like they were in the past. I mean, just I mean, you see a malicious uh, process, just you know, you can kill it. And and if you kill a malicious, pr I mean, a process in your production environment, you might uh, result in some uh, uh, outage uh, or, or like other other uh, you know business consequences. Uh, so you don't want to do it. So doing it in the cloud is is challenging. And also there is the uh, kind of uh, skill uh, challenge that you have now to train a lot of people to you know monitor a new environment. So on prem, you know, it's there for years. Cloud is is new. So you have to make sure that everyone knows what what how this environment look like. Uh, so let's start with that. So with cloud detection response. So how, how the process looks like in your organization? Who owns like how, how the SOC organization looks like? Who owns you know, detection response in the cloud? So that's on my team. So we are the facilitators for the response capabilities. And uh, what we do is we empower, again, through our security champions program, we empower those folks to help us with any context, right? Um, and then from there, we also make sure we're providing you know, documentation uh, along with that and run books. And then not only are we providing that documentation, we're actually running through those processes through tabletops and through different CTF type events to make sure people are familiar and getting that muscle memory with how to respond in the cloud to any event that happens in the cloud. Uh, and making sure they understand the totality of all the different actions we can take. So it's not just about containment of a, you know, of a workstation or, a, or of a workload, but it's also identity, right? How do we revoke the keys? How do we think about rotating creds, things of that nature in the cloud and making sure we're practicing those skills across all of our business units. I think the practice part is a huge, huge win because you also get feedback. Like, hey, 
this took me a long time to do, or hey, this is really impacting, this would be really impacting if we were to do it. So understanding those things and making sure we're communicating again through our security champions so that we know what the potential impact is across the whole org. And I think that's important. Thank you. And I think the, the next topic and the last, uh, last for, for today is actually about uh, you know, building the cloud security team. So it's not only about you know, how the processes for, uh, what are the processes for detecting these uh, 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 threats? It's about how you build it, like who, who are the relevant uh, uh, people to bring to such a team? So are they, should they have security background, engineering background? What do you do? How do you find the right people for the team? So first thing I do is I always ask myself, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Right? What are the problems that we're trying to solve on my team? And then I figure out, okay, from the problems we're trying to solve, um, is this individual, uh, does he, this individual have the qualities needed to solve that problem? So if they're a developer and I'm looking for someone to automate something, I can have them partner with someone that's security centric to give them that hand holding on the security side. And then flip side, if it's more of a security type person or task that I need fulfilled, then I ask myself, okay, can they be partner with a developer to understand how to automate or how to develop things and really creating these partnerships like that to force multiply and grow talent. I think that's been huge. The other thing is when I interview or when I try to bring someone on board, I always try to understand the why behind them. What, why are you doing this? What's your inspiration? Where do you want to go next? And really understanding like what their passion is so that the work can align with their passion because there is nothing better than a team member that is passionate about what they do because they, they just love and they just live, sleep, and breathe this stuff. And it's awesome to see them grow doing something they're passionate about. So understanding that stuff has been really great for my team and growing them and, and learning through this journey of cloud that we're all going through. Amazing. Um, yeah, I think, I think as I say for me, I really agree that uh, you have to find the people who really love it and love to learn because I think cloud is always like it's about learning and you know, and there's like the new, there are always new th services, always new threats. So finding people who, I mean, really lo love learning it. So the background is, I mean, sometimes you need you know, specific background, specific knowledge, but other than that, finding people who really love to learn, really want to, you know, ne never uh, like know, really, like, know the answers. They don't want to, they don't like not knowing what's, what's, uh, what, what's happening. Yeah, they just, they just go out and they get it, right? Yeah. And uh, for you as a manager, what, what do you see that is like the, maybe the largest uh, challenge with, with uh, building a cloud security team? Well, first, uh, there's a couple of things. So like first and foremost, avoiding burnout. This job is stressful. Like it's a lot of work, a lot of hours, right? So making sure you're giving your folks on your teams that autonomy to take vacation, remind them to take vacation, actually in some cases force them to take vacation, especially you know, if there's an opportunity and there's nothing actively happening, get them, get them out there, get them to see the world, get a hobby, you know, live life, right? And then when they're recharged like that and, and they're motivated and they're passionate, they come back to work and they wanna do more cool things, right? With security and overall. Uh, the other thing is, you know, just making sure you're engaged, right? Asking questions and, and pushing, right? Uh, constantly asking like, what's next? You know, where can we go? And, and as a leader, sometimes I could be wrong. So hearing that input and then applying it so that we can get better as a team is huge. Cause it's not just a one man show, it's everyone. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. couldn't uh, agree more. Mm. Okay, thank you, Jose. Um, so now we're going to uh, summarize it. I think, I mean, first, really, again, thank you for these uh, amazing insights. And, you know, I think uh, you, you couldn't uh, have, uh, you know, someone better who will, uh, you know, teach you all these uh, kind of uh, uh, stories from, from the front line, from the actually doing the work. So sometimes when we do research, you know, we are kind of in our lab and, you know, we, we are focused on, on what we do and, you know, investigating. But, you know, when you actually experience it to someone who actually has to do it, uh, these, to deal with these day-to-day -day challenges, it's a, a whole uh, different perspective. So I really appreciate uh, the, the knowledge that you shared with us today. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so just to summarize, I mean, we have some, some like, uh, you know, short uh, uh, um, uh, lessons that uh, you, you can uh, take. And uh, so with the API attacks, I think that what we show is that visibility, uh, you know, understanding visibility is, is, is the key. Uh, and understanding misconfigurations is, is another, uh, you know, a challenge. And this is something that you, you need to have. Um, 
for uh, yeah, so lapsus we didn't uh, touch it something a topic that uh, we skipped, so I'll skip it uh, also now for uh, data exposure. So we really recommend you know monitoring, you know understanding all the instances of of data storage that that you have. So it can be again hosted databases, past databases, storage. You have to understand all of them, and you know ne never forget that uh, there might be another uh, another database uh, somewhere. Uh, for a software supply chain, uh, it's the, you know, scan and prioritize all the infrastructure, the images, you know, make sure you have the right processes for that. And for identity supply chain, make sure that you validate all the third party services that, that you uh, uh, allow in your environment, all the roles that you allow in your environment, make sure that they really need all these permissions. Uh, now for like if you want to stay ahead of different cloud threats, so we have some uh, uh, resources that we use uh, at WIS. So there's the Open Cloud Vulnerability Database. Uh, we also wrote uh, security. This is something more before your engineering teams. Uh, we wrote uh, based on the vulnerability research that we, uh, uh, we, uh, we, we've had. Uh, we wrote an isolation framework. It's a how to build if you use uh, um, a multi-tenant uh, services or build multi-tenant services, how to build it in a secure way, how to avoid cross-tenant vulnerabilities. So we recommend you, uh, um, um, I mean, re reading these materials. It's another, like it's an uh, open uh, website. Uh, there is a GitHub repository where you can, uh, um, you know, add comments and uh, request uh, for that. Yeah, and uh, so that's, that's uh, shortly about Wiz. And uh, now we'll uh, uh, open the floor for questions.